Hello, welcome to our Unit 8 notes on the Civil War. This section is called The War Erupts, and this is Part 1 of 2. So we're going to go ahead and get started in Unit 8. So the day that we've been talking about in our last unit, um, the April 12th, 1861 date, that officially starts the Civil War, and that is a battle at Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter is a federal fort located in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, it is essentially like this little island that has a fort on side, inside. And what happens that leads to this particular battle is it's in South Carolina. It's right off the coast of South Carolina. But the people that are maintaining the fort on the inside are supporting the Union. South Carolina secedes from the Union and the Confederacy attacks Fort Sumter. So even though it's just off the coast of South Carolina, what's happening is the guys inside the fort are Union soldiers and they're being attacked by Confederate soldiers. So this is considered to be the official start of the Civil War. So let's watch a short little video. It's going to describe the first battle of the Civil War. The Civil War began at 4.30 a.m. on the 12th of April, 1861. General Pierre Gustave Dutant Beauregard ordered his Confederate gunners to open fire on Fort Sumter. At that hour, only a dark shape out in Charleston Harbor. Confederate Commander Beauregard was a gunner, so skilled as an artillery student at West Point that his instructor kept him on as an assistant for another year. That instructor was Major Robert Anderson, Union commander inside Fort Sumter. pent-up hatred of the past months and years is voiced in the thunder of these cannon, and the people seem almost beside themselves in the exaltation of a freedom they deem already won. The signal to fire the first shot was given by a civilian, Edmund Ruffin, a Virginia farmer and editor, who had preached secession for twenty years. Of course, he said, I was delighted to perform the service. Thirty-four hours later, a white flag over the fort ended the bombardment. The only casualty had been a Confederate horse. It was a bloodless opening to the bloodiest war in American history. The first gun that was fired at Fort Sumter sounded the death knell of slavery. They who fired it were the greatest practical abolitionists this nation has produced. April 13th. So civil war is inaugurated at last. God defend the right. All right, so here's a map that shows um, Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, here's Fort Sumter. So when you go to visit there, uh, my family actually visited there last summer. No, two summers ago. Um, we went out to uh, see Fort Sumter. This is what it looks like from the air. So you can tell it's not really that huge of an island. Basically, the fort is most of the island. And this is a picture that I took on top of what's now kind of like the museum. You can see uh, Charleston is down here. So the only way to get to it is with a boat that docks and then it lets you off. So here's me checking out a cannon at Fort Sumter. But that's what Fort Sumter looks like. And there's my family at Fort Sumter. So it's been kind of like a dream of mine to see Fort Sumter for most of my life. And so it was kind of cool to actually go there two summers ago. And there's kind of a cutaway that shows what it looked like before the attack. 
All right, so the Civil War has officially begun. Lincoln, the president of the Union, calls out for troops, uh, basically to join the army. Um, this is a really interesting picture of Lincoln. Um, this is just at the beginning of when they're um, taking pictures, and you're going to see kind of like the birth of photography happen um, during the Civil War. But this is an actual uh, photograph of Abraham Lincoln. You can kind of tell how tall he is compared to some of the other people that are around him, some of the generals. Virginia is going to be a really important state in this uh, for a lot of different reasons, but probably the most important is it's a huge state physically as far as just the amount of land. It has the largest population of any of the states. It's uh, home to many of the great military leaders. So when people are deciding if they're going to like join one side or the other, um, that's going to play a major role. And Virginia ultimately decides to go with the Confederacy, which is going to be really important. Now, if you look at this old time map here, you can see Virginia. You'll notice that at the beginning of the war, Virginia includes what we now consider also to be West Virginia. So what's going to happen during the war is the people that live in this part of Virginia, the northern part and the western part, are going to decide that they don't really agree with the idea of joining the Confederacy and having um, pro-slavery government. So they break away and then form their own state and call themselves West Virginia. So that's why West Virginia exists today. One of the people living in Virginia that's going to be very influential is uh, the General Robert E. Lee. Um, Robert E. Lee was considered to be probably the most important military mind at that time. And he was going to do whatever his state decided to do. People were very loyal to their state back in this time period. And um, Robert E. Lee, because Virginia decides to go with the Confederacy, becomes a general in the Confederate Army and is probably head and shoulders above the others as probably the best general um, at that time period. So this is what it looks like uh, when we start the war. Um, you'll see kind of this dark brown line. Those are the states that are the Confederacy before the Battle at Fort Sumter. Once the Battle of Fort Sumter happens, then they join these states, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. Um, the Union states are the ones in green. So you've got Oregon and California, Kansas, and then you've got all these states here. And then you'll notice that there are some states that have kind of an extra green uh, border around them. Those are Union states, but they're states that also still allow slavery. So... Um, those are what we call border states. And Missouri is one of these, okay? So they're states that stay with the Union. This is kind of confusing, but they stay with the Union, but they also, oh, my little update's coming up here, um, but they also officially allow slavery. So that would include Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, and West Virginia, okay? So we'll look at a map here. And you'll see the border states here in yellow. And a lot of times students say, well, why didn't they just force them to give up slavery? Um, Lincoln did not want any of these states to basically be put in a corner and have to decide um, between having slaves and then leaving the Union. Um, these were all important states for a variety of reasons. And Lincoln wanted them to remain in the Union and basically allowed them to continue to have um, slaves during the war. Um, but... Lincoln also knew that if they won the war, they would be able to then deal with the slavery issue after the war was over. So this is the way the United States basically squares up. The states in blue are Union. The ones that are white are not actually states at this point. So it's kind of weird, but we settled the western part of the United States um, before we settled this middle part that's still territories. So you do have some Union states that are out in the west um, with all this kind of like territory land in the middle. Kentucky is a major border state. It contains a ton of rivers, and rivers were how they transported a lot of troops and goods and materials. So if you think of them as almost like kind of like the interstate system of today, um, that makes Kentucky a really important border state to the Union. President Lincoln is a great leader. Uh, we'll talk more about Lincoln as we go through the notes, um, but he has a pretty good idea of what he wants to accomplish throughout the war. It's a very difficult war when you think about a civil war when you're fighting your own country, essentially. So um, we'll talk more about Lincoln as we go through, but Lincoln was a very good leader, and that's one of the advantages the North has. 
The Union also has huge advantages, as we talked about in the last unit, um, as far as um, people and resources. They've got a huge advantage in factories, railroad miles. They're the ones that are producing ships at the Navy shipyards. Um, so they've got a, a lot of advantages there. And using these resources, the Union plans to try and destroy the South's economy so that eventually the South is forced to basically end the war. So if they can do this by squeezing their economy, they won't really have to potentially or hopefully be in a lot of major battles where a lot of people are killed if they can do stuff economically. Because the Union has control of the Navy at the time, they can establish what is uh, called a blockade. A blockade is essentially when you used armed forces to prevent ships from going in or out of an area. So in this case, the Union is going to blockade the South. If the South can't get cotton and different things um, shipped out of the South or have stuff from other countries shipped into the South, their economy is going to collapse. So this particular plan to try and blockade the South is given a specific name and it's called the Anaconda Plan. The Anaconda Plan is the Union plan to shut off all of the Southern trade and eventually ruin their economy. So the Anaconda is a very, um, it's, it's very deliberately named the Anaconda Plan. So I'm going to show you this little video here. If you don't like seeing gross things, you might want to fast forward. But this will explain why it's called the Anaconda Plan. Oop, go back here. That was completely gross, but it does a really good job of describing why they called it the Anaconda Plan. This is a famous political cartoon of the time, uh, Scott's Great Snake. It's named after one of the uh, Union's military leaders, but it shows, in essence, like them creating this snake or this Anaconda Plan that would eventually constrict and shut off the South's economy. So just like a Anaconda Snake um, devours its prey by squeezing it and like slowly causing it to die. That's what the Union wanted to do to the economy of the Confederacy. All right, so that's where we're going to stop section one or part one, and we'll come back and we'll finish the war erupts with uh, part two in the next video. All right, thanks guys.